Okay, and we're recording. So welcome back to Reform Polemics. You're a sunny, somewhat sunny morning in California. Uh, Joshua joining us from all the way from the East Coast. Uh, we're going to be talking, as the title of the video says, Reform, not Calvinist. We're going to be speaking in terms of what it means to be a part of the Reform tradition. And we're going to be talking about some points that we regard as deviations from the Orthodox tradition, the Orthodox Reform tradition. So, uh, uh, Joshua, why don't you give us a brief introduction about yourself, and sure. we can go ahead and get started. Yeah, so my name is Joshua Janier, as you guys can see from uh, my name tag thingy. Um, originally from New York City, but I live in Florida. I am a upper school literature teacher, so um, love that job. Um, and then I am a student at the King's College in New York City, but I live in Florida, so I'm doing that online for the time being. But We'll be soon, hopefully, Lord willing, we'll be in New York soon. And I guess a lot of my, res most of my research interests consist of obviously post-Reformation theology, um, but I think an extension of that, I guess a relatively new interest of mine is um, early modern jurisprudence, particularly um, Reformed Orthodox jurisprudence, because there's, it's a heavily neglected field, obviously, I think, you know, we, we thank Richard Muller who will be a, a frequently mentioned figure that we'll mention throughout this vi throughout this video. Um, Muller has really contributed to the um, the retrieval of post-Reformation uh, orthodoxy, reform scholasticism. Um, however, um, heavy neglected field just due to time and also just there's not there are there are people who are interested in, in the topic, guys like Time and Klein, um, who you know, has amazing tweets and he writes stuff for American Reformer, the American Mind, and the American Conservative, who are trying to reincorporate and trying to just, yeah, just reinstitute and retrieve um, Reformed Orthodox jurisprudence. So, yeah, uh, so early modern jurisprudence for me kind of consists of uh, kind of late medieval period going into the 16th and 17th century. So studying a lot of common lawyers, guys like William Blackstone, whose who's painting is behind me, Edward Cook, because um, they're all, especially guys like Blackstone, Cook, Matthew Hale, all of them, Matthew Hale in particular, he would spend Sunday mornings just, you know, writing uh, notes on theology. So <laughs> theology very much does um, influence, and obviously the, the Christian natural law tradition does influence the common law. So that's kind of my, what I'm interested in. Um, yeah, I mean, theology is kind of a first love and I'm glad that through the work of Moeller and others, we've, we've been granted access to these sources, but yeah, that's kind of what I do. Nice. nice. Yeah. That's, that's been, like you said, it's a neglected thing to study. And of course it's not been on my radar, but then I saw on Amazon, a quick little read I can pick up on um, speaking of medieval into reformational uh, mm -hmm. natural law and uh, the, the the law in general. Um, yeah. I got this, you know, you know, trying to you know get into the field because you know, like you said, you it go. is. I have it right here. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I, I barely started on the first page. Just you know, get get a brief introduction to this donkey, but um, but yeah, that's good, and um, I think that is a a good good help uh you know bringing up some brief points as to how some of these uh areas of study have been neglected especially within the realm of mm -hmm. theology which will be our primary focus today of course um i think yeah I th well what do you in terms of the title of the video and in terms of kicking off the conversation uh with regards to the contentions that may be ar arisen um some mm -hmm. maybe pushback uh, probably some who are, you know, in, in, in modern terms, or sorry, in, in today's terms, which would be appropriated from like previous terms, like non-conformist people who would not like to conform themselves to the so-called reform tradition. Uh, just keeping all, all in mind, how would you essentially kick, kick start the video, kick start the conversation into how we can discuss Calvinism in terms of mm -hmm. its anachronistic sense and, and yeah. the classical reformed or yeah, and I think it's I think it'd be helpful to kind of set set the context of how we got here, um, right. because this is this is I mean this is not how you know after the Reformation and the subsequent post Reformation periods, 
um, you know, Reformed Orthodoxy was just upstream. It was upstream in the British Isles, right? It was just, it was standard. Um, you still had it on the continent. And really the Enlightenment starts to change. I won't, I won't really focus much on the Enlightenment. Maybe we'll come back to it. But the Enlightenment and kind of, and, and Moeller's, Moeller's understanding in his first volume is that with the decline of post-Reformation orthodoxy came the subsequent advent of the Enlightenment. And with the Enlightenment, a lot of our both, both, the, both our theological and metaphysical assumptions change. The way that we view theology, um, theology is no longer the queen of the sciences, and what's preferred is the natural sciences. And it takes a long time for that to actually happen. And that's kind of the context that you know a lot of people grew up in. That's the context that Moeller grew up in, uh, theological discussions and belief in God, and <clears throat> really that you know taking Reformed Orthodoxy seriously was just in a huge decline. And they also, you also see it with um, with some of the 18th century theologians, 19th century theologians, and, and 20th century theologians. Guys like Cornelius Van Til, um, right? Someone who's, I guess we would say, confessionally reformed, but because of um, because of the context that he grew up in, and I don't think his his let's say his apologetic is a production of his context. I think it's actual genuine convictions that he held. But um, understanding the context also elucidates why he held those positions, right? I mean, uh, to my knowledge, I don't think Van Til knew, knew Latin. Because um, with, with the rise of the Enlightenment comes the decay of education. And let's say guys like Francis Turretin, Antoine Willeus, Heisbertus Vutius, right? You can, you can name them, right? They received a more robust education than let's say our our reform ministers receive, let's say at Princeton, right? Although theological education at Princeton in the 18th century was very robust compared to today, it was not, it couldn't even be compared to the kind of education that ministers were receiving at the University of Leiden or at you know Calvin's Geneva or you name it. So the kind of that's kind of the context that Moeller's four volumes, post-reformation reform dogmatics, is kind of that's where he finds himself. Obviously, you have um, the uh, the decline of orthodoxy in Old Princeton, which was kind of like Old Princeton. Obviously, the the colonial founded um, universities like Harvard, Yale. You have the decline of religious teaching and, and you know the the propagation of Reformed orthodoxy in these in these universities, and it kind of informs a lot of bad scholarship. Um, one, because our ministers didn't have access to the sources, right? So they couldn't, they couldn't pull up the Latin synopsis um, because one, they didn't have a thorough understanding of Latin. And um, so they wouldn't see the relationship. They were obviously the synopsis is the genre is disputation. And obviously that, that has a scholastic <coughs> connotation. And since these sources weren't available to our ministers, a lot of, a lot of our assumptions we, a lot of our ministers and a lot of our professors had really, really bad assumptions. And I think, you know, the epitome of bad assumptions is, is people like Cornelius Van Til. Um, and you see all the assumptions that Muller kind of, you know, destroys in his works. It's kind of embodied by Cornelius Van Til. And one of those bad assumptions, right, since Calvin was translated, Calvin, obviously Calvin wrote the Institutes in the, um, the middle of the uh, 16th century, um, it was in French, Latin, then translated into English, right? Since Calvin is really the only thing that people have, um, and you know the term, and that's kind of like I don't, I don't really know when the term Calvinist. Um, I guess it was always a term, um, especially in, in yeah, the Reformation uh, period. Probably, yeah, yeah the, especially in the, in the you know in the mid seventeenth uh, century, of course. Mm -hmm. in the, large polemical context within the you know lutherans dominicans yeah jesuits of course, that was a term relatively thrown around but definitely not in the sense in which we know today yeah i mean and, and usually as you as you mentioned like you know the term was mentioned was i guess referred to and only invoked in polemical contexts right so calvinist was kind of a pejorative term right lutherans calling the calvinist because you know you know we're referring to the Calvinists and their in their different views of the ubiquity of the of the body of Christ, and obviously you have inter 
inter-Christian debates between the Jesuits, the Catholics, the Reform, etc. So it was usually a pejorative term, and, and whenever it was used positively, I'm pretty sure from my reading of it, it wasn't it wasn't all encompassing, right? It wasn't the way that we understand it today. Usually, right. when when the term Calvinist is used today, a lot of the assumptions behind Calvinism is the five points, um, a deterministic view of predestination, um, a sort of rationalism. Um, However, that's one. I mean, Richard Muller, Richard Muller has written an article. I think it's in the Calvin Theological Journal. I could, I could be wrong about that, but he has um, an article called "More Than Five Points," where he just he he lays out essentially what our argument will be. It's that um, you know, or where, whether Calvin was a Calvinist and 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 how Calvin would kind of disagree with some of our our modern day Calvinists. But the the way that right, we get started right. on the, the Calvinist term, right? What the Calvinist term presupposes is the number one assumption that Richard Muller debunks in his writings is Calvin qua normative for the Reformed tradition. Calvin as normative for the Reformed tradition. And that's something that's, and if, if that's your view of, let's say, the Reformation periods, if Calvin is the, is the normative theologian for the Reformed tradition, he defines it in everything that he writes. And therefore, you're going to look at, let's say, I don't even want to go into the, the you know, 100 years after Calvin with guys like Turretin or Vutius. Let's just look at a contemporary right. of Calvin. Like Beza or something. Yeah, like, or Beza or Vermigli. The genre, and this is, this, is where, this is where people who, you know, self-consciously hold these assumptions, um, this is where their argument kind of collapse, collapses. Because what they don't understand is that the genre of Calvin, who's a second-generation reformer, is much different from the genre of, let's say, Franciscus Unius, who's an early Orthodox theologian. And for those who aren't right. familiar, um, post-Reformation historians kind of categorize um, the periods of Protestant scholasticism in three periods. You have the period of early Orthodoxy, which, according to Van Asselt, whose categorization that I, categorization I find more more helpful than Muller's, it's not a major thing, but Van Asselt uh, identifies the early period of Orthodoxy from 1565 to 1620, so right after the Senate of Dort, um, mm -hmm. and then the high period of Orthodoxy to 1620 to 1650, I believe, and then 1650 going in, well, sorry, 1620 to 1700, and then the late period, the high period of Orthodoxy, and then the late period of Orthodoxy is 1700 to 1750. And Actually, each of those periods... Yeah, Muller's each of those each of those periods. Muller, the high, yeah, Muller goes a little bit farther, um, but I mean it's it's not a major thing. I just think I think Van Asselt's category cate categories. I think it's much more. It explains a lot of the things that are going on in those periods. All of those periods right. have you know their their problems um, and different uh, issues that they're addressing. One of the issues right. that. Uh, the early orthodox theologians are addressing is counter-reformation polemics guys like bellarmine right that's that's kind of the period that right. bellarmine found in um, and kind of trying to establish protestant doctrine in in the face of um counter-reformation polemics the high period of orthodoxy is kind of like it's a, it's really a golden period um it's, that's the way that van also kind of uh describes it um the yeah. hubs for Theology are the University of Leiden, which was where Jacob Arminius taught, Franciscus Unius taught. It's where Heisbertus Vutius was was trained. Um, yeah, multiple multiple early modern universities on on the continent, and then also, obviously, the University of Oxford, uh, Cambridge, etc. Um, mm -hmm. The high period of orthodoxy. What these theologians are doing is that they're building upon. The, the systems that were passed down to them, let's say Franciscus Unius's treatise on true theology or Polonius' syntagma. Right. What, the high, what the theologians of the high period of orthodoxy are doing is that they're solidifying these categories, right? So it's like Muller in, in his first volume, he has kind of like an analogy. The early period of orthodoxy, and I'm, and I'm paraphrasing, the early period of orthodoxy kind of sets in place the skeleton, right? The skeleton for the system. And then the high period of orthodoxy refines and codifies that model that was laid out in the early period of orthodoxy. Right. The late period of orthodoxy, right. um, once you once you get into the middle of the 17th century, you have the the advent of um, Rene Descartes, and Rene Descartes has personal um, 
personal correspondence with High Spiritus Vucius, who, um, who's kind of, I'm forgetting who calls him this, but High Spiritus Vucius for the Reformed tradition is kind of the, uh, the Protestant Thomas Aquinas um, in terms of erudition. But um, right. the late period of orthodoxy, the major issue facing the late period of orthodoxy is the rise of Enlightenment rationalism. And uh, it's very interesting that this is the rise of the Enlightenment and the rise of Enlightenment philosophers kind of leads to the, the rise of federal theology as a category in theology. Um, so a lot of our, a lot of our, a lot of the, the Protestant systems, especially by the Coxian theologian, let's say like Solomon Van Til or um, Campagius Vitringa, a lot of their systems hinge on their their federal theology. Um, while federal theology obviously didn't start with Coxeus, um, but it started to become really a category of, uh, of you know, your various systematic works and um, what was implicit in the, in the you know, the, the, the early periods of the high period of orthodoxy kind of becomes really emphasized um, in, in the, the middle of the 17th century. But with the rise of uh, uh, Enlightenment rationalism in the, in the beginning of the 18th century, reformed orthodoxy um, starts to decline. And there's, there's a great quote in Muller's first volume that, that philosophy and theology were so interwoven that and I'm paraphrasing again, that the advent of a new philosophy would lead lead to a new divinity. And that's exactly what happens. Um, in the 18th century, the merging of, especially with theologians who were more, um, more Cartesian than reform, the merging of a new philosophy with the divinity leads to an altogether new divinity. So that leads to the decline of reformed orthodoxy and therefore um, kind of the strengthening of enlightenment rationalism. Right. But what those what the periods reveal is that one there's there's an organic structure to the Reformation itself because I those periods cover scholasticism in general, but within those periods you find uh, Reformation Reform scholastics, and the the organic unity between the Reformation and the period of, the periods of Orthodoxy is one understanding what the Reformation was. The Reformation was primarily an ecclesiastical movement. Right? It started in the church, right? Getting the Bible into the the lingua franca of the people, right? what, what, you know, getting getting in the original language, those things, those were the emphasis of those were the emphases of, of the Reformation. But as Moeller points out, how could the Reformation continue? It had to be taught. Reform doctrine had to be codified. So this is just a traditional right. distinction between popular theology, theology of the laity, which kind of characterizes. Um, the genre of the works of the first and second generation reformers, but to those who would say Calvin as normative, and let's say let's just say they say the second generation reformers are normative because they're not concerned with scholasticism or rationalism, etc. Whatever they would say, it's very interesting when you look at let's say Calvin's Institutes and let's say Peter Moore Vermickley's commentary on the Nicomachean Ethics or his dialogue on the two natures of Christ. The genre is very, very different. The reason why, and a lot of things that people underestimate and they look over, is that the genre of Calvin's Institutes was never meant to be a dogmatic handbook. And Muller explicitly says that. What, what Calvin Institutes, I mean, tr um, in the context of Calvin writing the Institutes, it was for Roman Catholics who converted to Protestantism, who wanted an introduction right, to the various loci of Scripture. It was never meant to be a dogmatic handbook that was lectured upon in the university. Something like, let's say, Polonius' Syntagma, that's something that was intended and presupposes the principles of the Reformation and presupposes the exegesis of the Reformation, but it just it sets out its doctrine in the forms of loci, and it's for it's it's intended for pedagogy, it's intended for teaching. That's something that right. a lot of people forget. But if you look at a contemporary of Calvin, you know, Peter Martin Vermigli, from my understanding, he was, he was, yes, he was trained as an Augustinian friar, but most of his life was spent in the university. If you look at a lot of these theologians who didn't do, let's say, pastoral work, and their work was just simply devoted to the university, they're having a lot of scholastic discussions that, let's say, Calvin is not having, because remember, Calvin is doing popular theology. 
He's doing theology right. for the laity. Right. Um, but what Vermigli and Zanke and Andreas Hyper Hyperius, Hyperius is someone who's, he's in the same period as Calvin. So you can't really take Calvin as normative, that Calvin defines what the Reformed tradition is and everyone's conforming to Calvin. Guys like Butzer and Bullinger, guys who are in the same period as Calvin, but they're doing theology. Yes, they're doing theology on the same principles of Calvin, the Reformed principles. So they're assuming sacred scripture as the external principle of faith. Um, right. They have and doctrine. Just to, just to kind of reemphasize, how, why would you say that Calvin was sort of the, the, the how did he become the biggest figure? How did he become the, the heat of the polemical arguments in terms of Protestant apologetics, in terms of uh -huh. defining what Reformed theology is? What, how would you define Calvin becoming the center uh, or the promulgator of Reformed theology? Yeah, I think it's, it has to do with a lot of 20th, I think a lot of anachronistic scholarship because to say that Calvin is normative is just is just an anachronism. I think it has to do a lot with the development of the five points or examining Calvin's or Bayes' predestinarian system and assuming that, oh, this is the predestinarian system that is integrated into the, let's say, the uh, the canons of Dort. But what's so, what's so surprising, and I'm forgetting where I read this from, but the, the delegates of the Senate of Dort in uh, 1618, um, you would be surprised that the predestinarian system that they were drawing upon were not was not Calvin. It wasn't Calvin. Right. It was Vermigli. So right, he the, was the actual, Thomas, right? Yeah, right. So it's so interesting. So you know where we get the five points, right? People who want to who want to you know cling on to their five points and say, you know, I have my predestinarian system, um, and I'm reformed but I don't want to uh, integrate and reincorporate the innovations of scholasticism, right? But, and, and uh, Patrick Donnelly has a, has a fantastic, fantastic essay on Vermigli and, and, and uh, Zanke as, you know, Calvinist Thomist, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, Vermigli was trained at the University of Padua in France, which was the most prestigious university at the time. And he was an Augustinian friar. So he would have, he would have been, acquainted with Thomas. Martin Butzer was a Dominican, right? Definitely acquainted with Thomas. But right. the development of the five points and the codification of not Calvin's predestinarian system, but the reforms predestinarian system, it was, they drew upon Vermigli and not Calvin. So Calvin, in the eyes of the reformers, was definitely not normative. What the Reformation is, 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 a, is especially the, the first and second generation reformers, it's a stream of influence, right? Calvin right. is an influence. Butzer is an influence. Bollinger is an influence. Vermigli is an influence. And yeah, also... especially just, just to point that out, and you mentioned Dort leading up to how they drew upon, uh, you know, from mm -hmm. Vermigli, I think it's important to note that the influence that Calvin had was not necessarily highly theological in the sense that it was more so ecclesiastical because, of course, uh, yes. the Son of Dort, you know, then you had delegates from from you know from, mm -hmm. from Britain, from, from Geneva. You had you know delegates from you know various sorts of places. So it's not that Calvin was essentially not even for Arminius in that sense that Calvin was being drawn upon or seen upon as this great theological figure or as like the Aquinas mm -hmm. of the day essentially. Um, I think that's, that's good to point it out because not even in that polemical context within Dort where you did you see any like oh well the reformed churches are calvinist or something like that because even you know but but by, by if you want if you want to define this by terms in, in which how we perceive even today then you you could even call arminius a calvinist essentially mm -hmm. in that context of the 19th century so i think it's important to i mean some people think that it is a disconnection well people say if you can't connect dort to calvin then the reformed tradition falls apart and it's exactly ties into what you're saying it doesn't necessarily yeah. say necessarily imply that calvin is is the hinge upon this or not like you said you have butzer in, in the early in the early reform period you have butzer bollinger you had um like you said vermigli all these figures that i find much more theologically uh, and on a theological level much more helpful than than let's say calvin and you know mm -hmm. and i i think you brought up a great point in terms of in what in what way was the institutes the institutes of the christian religion in what in what way were they utilized yeah. Um, I see a lot of seminaries, a lot of, a lot of lay people for the most part, 
think that the the, the institutes are, are sort of you know like you said the, the greatest reformed orthodox handbook that you can possibly have and um i don't i don't want to speak maliciously about calvin or anything but no. you know i i both, you, you and i both have read the, the institutes very early on in our, our journey right um and i'm not i don't want to say that they're vague but in terms of everything else that surrounds reformed orthodoxy um it like like you said it doesn't really get to that point where it teaches mm -hmm. the entire low side um or mm -hmm. a codification of reformed orthodoxy so it just wanted to point that out within the context no of it's like course. no yeah i think you're pointing out something really really good now this this obviously the, the the point of the video is not to rave on calvin to say that calvin is filled with ambiguities and shouldn't be read no that's not what we're saying what we're saying is that calvin himself never viewed himself as normative and right calvin is not was not normative for the reformed tradition and i think that you know it's it's really a dichotomy and an anachronism to read that back in it's like something that I find much more enjoyable and what was normative, you know, Calvin's institutes fulfills its purposes. What are, what are, what are its purposes? Like, for example, when we first read Calvin, what Calvin was doing is like, you know, I guess we were relatively new to the reformed tradition. And what it did right. is that it, it served as a good primer to what reformed theology is. However, right. in regards to what was, um, what was, taught at the university stuff like the light and synopsis right this is it was a handbook to theology for ministers at the at in, in, the, in the 17th century um right. there's other works i mean there's compiled disputations from the university of geneva and various universities on the continent right so calvin was never normative for the reformed tradition and none of the theologians and you, you especially when you read when you do the primary source reading i mean I'm trying to think of this. The synopsis seldomly quotes Calvin. Right. Right. It just, it just, yeah, a lot of 17th century works just don't, yeah. just don't really quote. I mean, they pay Calvin some mind and it's right. not to say that they didn't, they didn't respect Calvin and they didn't like Calvin. It's just it's, Calvin it's, it's, yeah, as a clarification of that. Of, yeah. Of theology, exactly. In regards to the sources of reformed orthodoxy, Calvin is one of them. But also, there's even sources that predate Calvin. The medievals. The medievals are reincorporated into the Reformed Orthodoxy. Right. You know, Unius is much more, you know, Unius would, would be much more inclined to quote Thomas than Calvin. Same with Amadeus Polanus. He quotes Thomas more than he does Calvin. So the... For, for the most part, even the 20, 20, 20, 20, 19th, 20th century theologians quote Aquinas exactly would count um, to my to my knowledge. Right. Um, so that that's really important because the successors of Calvin, they did view themselves at the, they did view themselves in step with Calvin, but they also right. viewed themselves in step with something that predated Calvin, and that's that's really really um, important to understand. And yeah, then, I think another, another thing, to, the really important thing to notice, is that. Um, like you said, the Synod of Dort, especially, I mean, like you said, the 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 the, the high Orthodox period. It, it, I mean, looking at it as how you term termed it as a golden age. Um, I think it is. I think that is a really helpful term because you not only had, like you said, a highly polemical uh, you know, context with Protestant and uh, you know anti-reformed or or um, you know the the those the apist apologists viciously attacking the reformed. Um, in terms of Protestantism, but you also had various amounts of debate surrounding the nature of grace within mm -hmm. the Dominicans and Jesuits, and within, I mean, technically, the Armenian controversy was an in-house debate between, you know, the Remonstrant Church revolting against the Reformed. And so in that sense, drawing upon in what way was the center, because look, you look at the center of the door, and I had a friend quote, send me a quote from a, what, what, uh, he regarded in the, especially in the book Beyond Dort and the Auxilian, mm -hmm. um, by the name of Jean Baptiste, right? He's, they regard him as one of the leading Thomists in the 17th century. And he regarded that the majority of Reformed theologians embraced Thomist views of grace and free choice. 
especially within the qualifications of Dort. Mm-hmm. And so when you look at in that, in that context, right, when, when, when you look at and see how Dort codified and established what is orthodox in terms of predestination as it's, you know, the, the first head of doctrine, of course, in the, in the election of man. And you tra- trace that back to Calvin, and not to this Calvin, but Edwin put out a good video um, on, on Calvin's knowledge of Thomas Aquinas, right, in that regard. And if we see the connection Vermigli had, for example, with Thomas or Butzer in his connection with Thomas, it's, it's, it's almost, I don't want to say antithetical, but it's almost, you know, night and day difference. Because even when I was reading the Institutes, I mean, this is before I even was introduced to the scholarship on this. When I was reading the Institutes, I saw a very, very vague interaction with Thomas Aquinas, mm-hmm. especially the And that, 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 that immediately caught my, caught my, caught my mind because I was also being more acquainted with um, Aquinas, especially in, in, in regards to this Calvinistic soteriology, which heavily is presupposed by a, a system on based upon predestination. You see that and I guess you can sort of see how you don't necessarily have to trace Dort to Calvin, but mm-hmm. at the same time, you can also see Calvin's contemporaries, which we will regard as the pillars of 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 the of Reformed theology, the true pillars, not just a pillar, which is Calvin. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think if you want to speak a little bit on that as well, in terms of what exactly, how exactly Thomas was appropriated. I know you were getting to that, but just just to kind of lay the yeah. question, you know, how how exactly Thomas Aquinas was appropriated within these great minds, like you said, Junius and Vermigli, um, especially in the latter half of um, of Reform Orthodoxy. For example, there's a book on John Owen, uh, Thomism, uh, and John Owen. Of course, Turretin mm-hmm. frequently cites him. Um, how 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 would you explain? this sort of codification, but m- more rather appropriately, more appropriately termed appropriation of Aquinas versus Calvin in, in this context. Yeah, I think that that is saying that video that uh, that Edwin put out on Calvin's knowledge of, of Aquinas and most likely Calvin's knowledge of Aquinas was secondhand. That that kind of elucidates a lot of our issues, right? I mean, as you said, but that's for me, it's like to go a little bit step further. It's like you know, Calvin. If we understand the genre of Calvin's Institutes as a manual for Roman Catholics who converted to Protestantism, you don't have to tell a, a former Roman Catholic who Thomas Aquinas is, right? It just it's it's right. kind of futile. Um, but right. yeah, it's like I think with the question about Thomas, the question about Thomas, a question that. Usually, what, what people are scared of, because obviously Thomas is one of is one of the many med- med- medieval scholastics. But a, a question, and I think the most, I mean, James White's recent tweet about scholasticism and <clears throat> you know, mark your calendar in ten years, because this, I think he called it synchronous. I'm I'm forgetting what he called it, but. This, this merging of scholasticism and, and Protestantism is going to lead to, I don't know, a third religion. I, don't, I really just, I mean, I, I really don't know. And obviously I want to give James White the judgment of charity because it seems like, but I just think he's, you know, but James White, you know, he's he's a representative of like what, what bad scholarship, not necessarily his scholarship, but the scholarship he was trained in produces, right? Right. It's like I can give you the quote what he said right now, just to put it in context. Yeah. He said, "Well, history right. tells us that this the temptation toward a scripture compromising scholasticism does not go away. It waxes like now and vines in various groups. It will do its damage. Mark it's mark this day in the calendar. Remind you ten years from now. Just watch. That's what he said. <laughs> so, well, ten years from now, nothing is going to happen, right? Because Moeller's been doing this for about right. thirty years. Um, yeah, I exactly. Think, I yeah. think things are getting better." And I think, yeah, I think it's, a, I don't, I don't know. I think you can only make sweeping judgments like that when you just don't, maybe it's been a while since James White, again, I don't, I don't know James White's knowledge of Latin. So it's not, I'm pretty sure he doesn't spend his Saturdays for rusing on PRDL. Um, but it's some, it's a good habit that people should pick up. But, but what, what right. that, what that tweet reveals is one, you know, a pejorative understanding of scholasticism. And this is another thing that Muller clears up in his writings. Scholasticism, 
and our Protestant theologians will say it. I mean, there was there was a really good Twitter thread and good presentation last year by David Sitzma on you know Calvin, Bootser, guys like Zanke and Vermigli, and this clause Puriori Scholastici, the pu the purer scholastics. Um, there's there's a quote from Zanke or Vermigli somewhere. It's that amongst the scholastics, Thomas is the purest of them. Right, so it's, you see that be, I'm not sure. But I've heard that. Might be, I'm not sure. If it's, um, but you see that there's, honest. right? You see these are second generation reformers going into the early period of orthodoxy, who don't speak about Thomas in the pejorative way that 20th century reform scholarship does, or Aristotle, for that matter, right. because kind of not necessarily the reception of Thomas necessitates, you know, reincorporating Aristotelian categories. But who's the guy who popularizes Aristotelian categories? It's Thomas. And I mean, I wouldn't hopefully, but like if, if we want to talk about Aristotelian categories in, in, in reformed body of divinities, it's everywhere. It starts out in the beginning, um, such as genus, habit, the intellectual habits, right? Whether theology is wisdom, a science, an art, Right. These are just the, the intellectual, the fivefold intellectual habits of Aristotle. You see that in Turretin, you see it in Unius, the genera, the genre of ectypal and, and archetypal theology. There's right. a positive reincorporate, reincorporation of Aristotle in the use of Aristotelian um, categories in our reformed body of divinities. It's just, it's just there. Right. You really can't Maybe do anything about it. I have to call it a, a reincorporation because, like you said, many of these guys are already trained in this field. So yeah. if you take that into context, these guys coming out of the Roman Catholic Church mm -hmm. necessarily incorporating anything. This is how they were trained. You know, they're 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 not you know bringing about this. You know, a lot of people quote you know Paul when he says don't hold to vain philosophies and and this mm -hmm. sort of modern appropriation that any sort of philosophical um, insights in which you try to appropriate theology is wrong and novel. Of course, everyone has their philosophy, and I think. I think Bovink, for example, um, defines philosophy as, as the most basic definition you can have is basically the theory by which you know, the theory by which you know things. And, mm -hmm. and I think in, in that sense, people are so antithetical to this that looking back into this reformed period where these great figures and where these great figures not only appropriated these things, but were trained in them, it's sort of like, I, I really don't know how, where to put them in this category because they still wouldn't essentially become, I'd say, comfortable because a, a lot of a lot of a lot of times people these people, especially, you know, within the Baptist circles, would it be comfortable with associating with Aquinas or these philosophical categories? Mm -hmm. And and I think this is more so like you mentioned in the beginning of the video. This is how they grew up. This is how I grew up. Right. I grew up thinking, you know, Bible alone, no, no other sources, um, you know, you know, Catholic bad, you know, all, all this kind of very vague, unsophisticated mm -hmm. category, completely unaware and completely naive as to where the later tradition in which I would become a part of where it came from. Right. Mm -hmm. So just circling back to the discussion in terms of how modern appropriations of what the reform drew upon and how they sort of look down upon them how would you say it's a better approach or a better you know our better approach how, how would you say our better approach can be or what approach can we take to sort of not reintroduce this but sort of demonstrate that this is what the reform tradition was based upon in the beginning yeah, I think that that gets to the question on like, well, that that question presupposes several other questions. What is the Sorry. nature of the Reformation, right? What is the nature of the Reformation? Is the Reformation because in in popular scholarship, people will almost talk about the Reformation as if like it's a complete departure from everything medieval and everything that is lowercase C Catholic. And, right. you know, thank God that Richard Mahler, Jordan Baller, David Sitzma, they've done a lot of the, the heavy lifting that William J. Van Esselt, um, they've done a lot of the heavy lifting to show that, no, 
you know, Mueller has a section in his first volume where the Reformation, the only, let's say, the, the only real low side that's really changed in the Reformation or reformed, right, is soteriology and, you know, a form, you know, church governance in a sense, the sacraments, right? They don't depart from everything that's medieval. So it's like, you know, the two natures of Christ. That's something that's upstream reformed theology, right? God's divine simplicity. So sorry, James White, it's upstream reformed theology, right? So this so, is just, so these are things, right? Yeah, exactly, right? So these, 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 these loci that were established and fundamental, right? They're not, they're not changed in the Reformation, right? What's, what's discarded and that and that what and what Moeller's project really hangs on are are two claims: Calvin is not normative, and scholasticism is a method. If if uh, if Moeller's right about the former, then he's also right about the latter, right? But if on these two claims, obviously the, there could be more, you know, and I guess the the guys who studied under Moeller can point out some. But for me, in my reading of Moeller, the two claims and practically the two claims where I see. These, these two claims I see as normative. A lot of people believe that Calvin is normative for the Reformed tradition, hence why they call themselves Calvinists, a five-pointer, etc. And then a lot of people believe that scholasticism refers to content instead of method, and this is something that's popular amongst Fantilian circles. But Heisbertus Vutius, in his Disputation on Scholastic Theology, he distinguished between two kinds, two uses of the term scholasticism. There's a loose term, there's a loose way of defining scholasticism, and the loose way of defining scholasticism refers to those papal, you know, there's, I'm forgetting who, who says it in Muller's first volume, but papal tyranny, right? These papal late uh, medieval inventions, right? And then also there's there's a strict way of defining scholasticism according to Vutius, who's reformed, right? He's not a rationalist. He actually had personal correspondence with Mr. Rationalist himself, Rene Descartes. And he has a disputation on Cartesianism. Right and and the um, has a has a has a disputation on, on his theory of cognition, which is just basically Aristotelian, not not rationalist. Right. Vutius understands the strict way of defining scholasticism to be the method of the schools, and Moeller emphasizes that the kind of scholasticism that was discarded by the post-Reformation theologians is a kind of late medieval scholasticism that stands in between revelation and reason. No, right? That's that's the scholasticism that they deny, and they vehemently deny it, right? Since the Reformed Orthodox have a good prolegomena, they understand what the what the principle of script what the, what the principle of theology is, and they only they only understand reason to be an ancil ancillary truth ancillary tool. It's only for right. the aid, not the establishing, only for the aid of uh, articulating and teaching. Theological doctrine, and and, and the that's in this in terms of how we can how, how can how can, uh, Turretin, I'm saying Turretin speaks volumes volumes into how we can appropriate appropriate reason and of course in in, in its sort of way a scholastic method into theology. Right? We don't mm -hmm. we don't want to become socian where we emphasize uh, rationalism over and against like you said revelation. I think that's mm -hmm. a very good point. In terms of not allowing or becoming, instead of it becoming a bridge, whereas we cannot understand revelation without this scholastic reason, but more yeah. so, like you said, a tool. This is how Francis Turton says it aids theology. It helps us in our mm -hmm. in our an appropriation of doctrine. I mean, and if people want to give pushback, I mean, just any theologian, whether like you said, any disputations, any 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 significant doctrine, uh, sorry, uh, any any significant documents from. Uh, these prestigious universities or within you know individual theologians for example my uh, my favorite you know method of theology is for example petrus von maastricht i think he delivers especially his prolegomena he establishes the the exegetical part of course the the uh the dogmatic part the eclectic part the practical part that is a very clear example of a scholastic yeah. method right you, you know it's i think it's very clear and i think that is something that should be highly sought to be retrieved especially in today's today's era mm -hmm. yeah and i think right it's like the reason why again like back on the genre there's there's a good 
Um, Muller's discussion in his first volume on theology as a discipline is, is really, really good to elucidate a, a lot of these issues, right? So right. instead of, let's say, if you're, if you're a laity and, um, and you under, understand yourself to be a Calvinist, right, and a five-pointer, and you're, you're afraid of the scholasticism, it's like, understand that the genre of the first and second generation reformers Right, it was highly analytical and exegetic. So it's exegetical. They're meditating on the sacred page, and they're doing exegesis. Now, in regards to a theological ex education, ex exegesis is good. Right, pastors should know how to do exegesis. Right. But in regards to teaching theology, right, you must have the analysis, which is, um, which is you know, analyzing the data of scripture, but. In order for something to be known, right, and this is this is in the reform, we can we can talk about method, but the reformed orthodox incorporate the Zambarillian method or Ramus method of theology. In order for something to be known, right, it needs to be put together, right. So, yes, there's there's you have the the, the biblical data, but that needs to be synthesized into a body of doctrine, a body of dogmatic theology, and lectured upon and taught, so that it can be taught properly in the pew. Right, be, uh, be taught properly at the pulpit, right? So right. that's that's yeah. really you you have so you sh people shouldn't see the change, especially after the death of Calvin and after the death of some of the second generation reformers, as something abrupt, as something unorthodox. What's going on is that we have universities, so we're not doing exegesis, right? We're not we're not doing preaching, right? We're we're teaching. We're teaching ministers right. a reform body of doctrine so that they, yeah, so, so that they may be able to teach this faith, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think a lot of times these, you know, going into the, to the, the category um, are, are one of our points in neo-Calvinism. A lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of people, at least I, for the most part, when I was um, a confessed, you know, my, my whole religion, Christian five point Calvinist, yeah. a lot of times, it was to you know, in 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 my in my own cognizance. I thought to myself, "This is I come to this knowledge, or I come to this position of holding to the five points solely based off of an exegetical principle. That's it, mm -hmm. right? I, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't get it off of anyone else. I didn't, you know, sort of exercise a sort of method by which I can exegete this, promulgate dogma, then you know, the elective part, and then the practical part." I, I feel like a lot of these neo-Calvinists sort of skip through all that, base it upon a purely exegetical, and I and I think because of that, they jump over these very important distinctions and categories mm -hmm. in terms of, for example, total depravity, as we've seen in Van Til, who took it to an extreme end, of course, and then you start to get these highly unorthodox views of mm -hmm. what originally is supposed to be incorporated in the in the system of reform theology, like Moeller says, he says that yes, there are remnants, of course, of total depravity, unconditional election, um, you know, limited atonement. There are, in one sense or another, they are incorporated into reform theology. But to flip it around and say, well, these the reform theology is what is promulgated in five points is to exactly yes. do what you're not supposed to do. Um, mm -hmm. So in terms of of like you said, drawing off from the method and and, and neo Calvinism. What would you say is 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 the great? I mean, at least for you, because I know you were in the same boat. We both were in the same boat. You know, five point Calvinists. You know, just, and then sort of moved into like neo Calvinism. What would you say is probably the biggest problem in terms of you know trying to. I, I don't know. I, I I guess it's sort of impossible to sort of say, oh, how do, how can we get yeah. people to stop saying Calvinism is reform mm -hmm. theology and reform theology is Calvinism? Yeah, I, I mean, what, what would you think? yeah, I think it what it what it takes is because it it, it it simply just takes doing the primary source reading. It's like you know, I look at the example of of both of us and, and Edwin as well. Um, for people who don't know, we originally met on TikTok and we were doing stuff on TikTok and we were just like McCarthyan, quasi-Baptist. You know, I wasn't a Baptist, but it's like, you know, <laughs> we're just McCarthyan or, you know, Paul Washer. That's that's all we knew of the Reformed tradition. And, and the way that these issues can be mitigated is just 
I mean, just through stuff like this, right? I mean, because I, I can't really remember when I stumbled upon Mahler, but I'm glad that I did. And then, you know, Cal, you know, I, I haven't said the word Calvinist in a long time. It's just like I'm reformed, right? It's like, uh, right? So it's like just just getting getting the sources in people's hands, especially especially for, for ministers because, you know, with Bible studies and with pastoral discussions and, Right. If we if we want this to be if we want an educated laity, if we want an educated layperson um, to be um, to have knowledge of let's say Moeller and and the uh, the Reformed tradition, it's like our pastors need to need to have Moeller. They need to read Moeller. Um, Moeller is something. I mean, I'm doing the the year in in the post Reformation Reform dogmatics, and a lot of the buddies that I'm doing it with, they they want to be pastors, and my my I, I, I don't want to go into pastoral ministry, but this has so much practical bearing on pastoral ministry. It's like as a pastor, I mean, it's just been printed need, again. Yes, it's just an excuse. So, so please get it if you don't have it. Right. As a pastor, you should have a working knowledge of your own tradition. You should. You know, it's not like I was I, I say this tongue in cheek, of course, and not to, to pump us up, but, you know, we're 20 year olds and we know how to function, use PRDL, you know, pastors, they should, they should know how to use PRDL and they should be like, Oh, I need a commentary. Let me just go to Vermeer's commentary on the judges. Right. So it's a lot of this, a lot of it's, it's a multi-generational thing. Like a lot of, I, I'm really, I think reform theology is a much more happier place than it was a couple years ago. I think this the sun the sun is definitely shining, like because you know Mueller students are, are professors now. Um, I'll be doing I'll be doing uh, work with Jordan Baller in the summer, who's one of Mueller students who is big on Wolfgang Musculus, um, which I'm very very nice. excited for. Um, so it's just yeah, it, it it takes it takes one it takes education, not necessarily going to a prestigious university, but just acquainting yourself with the sources. So. Read more. Like, yeah. And and be open to it. It's like, you know, take for example, like I'm I am, you know, everyone's a theology student, but particularly what I want to do is I want to be a lawyer. You know, I guess some people are asking, like, why if you want to be a lawyer, why are you reading Mueller? It's because it's an indispensable source, right? Especially if I'm studying if I'm studying the common law, if I'm studying guys like John Owen, I need I need somewhere, right? Especially because you know, when people are doing the, uh, theology in the post-Reformation period, they're doing law as well. And there is a close relationship. Um, Todd Rester was talking about at the University of Leiden, there was a, there was a tradition where um, the theological faculty and the law faculty would kind of trade disputations, right? They would trade their disputations and, and the, the lawyers would read the theology disputations and the lawyers would read, um, the, the, the theologians would read the, the law disputations. If we want it, like, especially for me, if I, you know, I'm, I love history and I love the early modern period. I think it's a golden age for many things, for education, um, for music, right? You get guys like Bach. Um, for me, as a lawyer, studying Moeller, especially as a reformed Christian, studying Moeller is, is great, right? Because I can, I can, I know where to categorize these guys. I know what's going on because all of this, all of this stuff doesn't happen in a bubble, right? Although Muller's right. primary focus, although Muller's primary focus is theology, it's like the Enlightenment had significant, significant, um, uh, just 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 as the Enlightenment had significant impacts on you know the the teaching of theology in the university, the Enlightenment had the same impact for the teaching of law in the university. The rise of legal positivism comes with the Enlightenment, right? So there's a lot of things that are going going on at the same time and as as someone who wants to be a lawyer and someone who loves early modern history and someone who's a reformed christian i find reading Mueller. it's like Mueller is someone those four volumes are always going to be on my shelf and i'm going to constantly refer back to them um i even think, if I think that's a fascinating them. combination just law and theology yeah. and just, I mean, ever since i started studying more of the classical reformed tradition and emphasis and more so its influence upon the, the the common good of, of man, especially within the mm -hmm. context of, of law, 
um, I mean, I, I used to be heavily drawn to law enforcement. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I did have a serious interest in becoming a law enforcement officer. And I kind of was like, you know, well, that has nothing to do with me wanting to study theology, you know, sort of like, but then th there's some sort of piety that comes in, right? That, mm -hmm. you know, in the sense that, you know, why are these officers enforcing the law? Well, they're enforcing the law for the common good of man. Mm -hmm. And this stems from the, of course, the natural law, which is heavily yeah. embedded in, in which God establishes as good for the common well-being of man. And I think yeah. that is a fascinating I mean, combination. It's, it's honestly it's so fascinating to me. There shouldn't be a divide. There shouldn't be, oh, well, one's a lawyer, one's a theologian. It's, and I think in, in, in this respect, in any profession, um, and especially as a biblical principle, one should strive to, to, to work for the common good of man, to do good to your neighbor. This is just common biblical principles within any profession in, in one way. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a lot of our favorite theologians were lawyers. Martin Luther, John Calvin, right? Franciscus Junius had a robust, I talked about that last week with Edwin. Um, yeah, it's, I, I think I think it's, it's Muller's an indispensable source and in studying the early modern period for anyone who's reformed. Like, because a lot of, I mean, probably Gamera is probably like my favorite topic, um, especially, you know, in regards to theology, and it's probably because with prolegomena, you're laying out the genera of theology and with you have distinct right. the distinction between, that you make within ectypal theology between natural, supernatural, uh, natural and supernatural theology. It's like, you know, you know, with natural theology, there's an extension of the natural law, etc. Um, but yeah, I think I think the way that back to the question of the way that these issues, the way that let's say Calvin Calvinism can be, I guess discarded from our vocabulary it just it takes right it takes conversations it takes discussions um like the one i'm, I'm having at my apartment just you know reading Mahler, having four guys come and just just talk about the reading and yeah because it, it goes a long way it really goes a long it way and, yeah yeah so circling back to the, the the final two points um, just uh, so we, we covered basically the, the most of it. So I think uh, in, in in terms of Moeller stemming off of not only negative articles that we're proclaiming, but, but also positive ones. Um, and this is the, the two latter, latter um, points that we want to make. Number one being that going back to these primary sources, as you mentioned, not only should discourage people from being solely five point Calvin's, but it should encourage mm -hmm. people to improve on their theological method. And what do I mean by that is, like I mentioned a little earlier, that most of the time these the acronistic five point Calvinist 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 sorry, most of the time these people go far and beyond the the, the bounds of Reformed orthodoxy, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just a fact. Far a lot of yeah. times, um, <laughs> right? Like you come into like a a cold uh, Jonathan Edwards determinism. Right, you you come into a, a an extreme skeptic total depravity of Van Til. You know, you come into mm -hmm. all these sorts of, and I'm not sure if you agree with that appropriation of Van Til, but seeing how seeing not only what Van Til said and also what his followers and today in which has it, it has been appropriated, I think that the doctrine of, for example, the I'm I'm putting a, a video of total depravity, total what total depravity is not, and in that. I see myself dealing with a lot of things that a lot of so-called five-point Calvinists actually adhere to. And most of the things I'm going to speak, speaking against what total mm -hmm. depravity is not, is mainly against what, you know, Calvinists themselves been appropriating for the past 30 years, 30, 40 years. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it's good that we recommend some sources. Um, I, I know Moeller, obviously no one's going to buy, not everyone's going to buy the four volume set. But yeah. what, how, how would you guide someone, for example, if they, if they came to you and said, Josh, I'm a five-point Calvinist, but I'm, I'm interested in, mm -hmm. in being more interwoven with the Reformed tradition and, and, and correct, and not only correct, but establish why I believe in, 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 in um, you know, unconditional election, for example, which presupposes classical theism, which presupposes, you know, divine simplicity, mm -hmm. which presupposes, um, you, know, you know, God's pure act. Yeah. What sources would you recommend to these people? Yeah, I think um, since Moeller, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend anyone to buy 
the line and synopsis unless you want to go broke. Obviously, I say that tongue in cheek. It's it's, it's great to have. Um, and obviously, Mueller getting through the four volumes can be daunting. However, I think uh, William J. Van Esselt's book, um, Introduction to Reform Scholasticism, I think it's it's a pretty really really helpful book. It's published with RHB. I think yeah, it, it really it wet your mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think it, it whets your appetite to what the Reformation is. You start to get, you know, you start to have these names and you start to, you, you can categorize these names. It's like, okay, I know when Eunice was born, I know the issues that he was dealing with. I know the period that he finds himself in. And that, that's, that's really, really helpful because then, especially if you're a theological student and you, you need to, you know, do some research and, and address a particular topic, you know, one, you know the period where this topic was addressed in the period of Reformed Orthodoxy, and you know the theologians to go to, which is great. It's a great, it's a great tool for pastors to, to have that working knowledge of, okay, I need to go to, to uh, let's say, Antoine Willeus on this issue, right? And obviously it would be nice if our pastors knew Latin. I think Latin is, is you know, that's something if, if you're really, really dedicated, learning Latin is something that you will you'll you'll never regret um yeah. but yeah i think there is just in most of the words we translate in our life so yeah in our lifetimes. Um, in our lifetimes. hopefully i think i think van asselt's book is really really good i think it will i think it will set in place one it will establish several several things it'll give you basic categories to because I, I understand especially when i first got onto prdl it was kind of daunting like it was it was very very hard to just like maneuver my way through through it but you know reading reading van Essels and reading Mueller, it's like okay i know the guys i know these guys and other dates and i know where they where they taught i know what, what they what their what their works consist of and now now it doesn't it's not as intimidating i think a lot of people are are held back kind of because of intimidation because obviously there's it's a whole swath of there's so much out there there's so much reformed orthodox literature out there and we're just having the basic, yeah, even you have translated and untranslated, right? It's like there's so much out there. And if you just have the basic building blocks, the basic foundations to just, okay, I, I'm, I'm working through it. So I think that that book is really helpful. It establishes one, the use of Aristotle. Um, that's, that's a very controversial thing today, especially in Ventilian circles. Um, and yeah, I think the, the chapters are very, very helpful. And then it has like, um, recommended reading, um, which most of the sources, some of them are translated, some of them are not translated. Um, and I, I think that's that's a, re a really good primer to, one, the Reformed tradition. It's like you're going to start to know some names of just not theologians, but also uh, uh, secondary literature on the topic. You're, you're going to be introduced to guys mm -hmm. like Moeller and Patrick Donnelly and, um, and Jordan Baller and David Sitzma. Those those, yeah, I think that that work was really helpful for me in particular, um, especially just as I continue to grow and um, learn more right. about, about this. Yeah, there's, there's, also, there's also smaller books. I think one really helpful one, I think you read this before, uh, Divine mm -hmm. Choice and uh, Human Choice, uh, Moeller, and there's also another small one. I think um, this one was pretty helpful, the book interpretation, formulation of the Reform mm. tradition, Edited by my bolt, my molar at least. There we um, go. So I think I mean there, there are small resources because you know ultimately what I found when I was reading, for example, the the you know post reformation reform dogmatics, is that as as I'm reading it, I, I started when I when I first got my set, I started in in um, uh, the third volume on the divine attributes because I was mm -hmm. studying uh, theology proper. What I, what I found is, especially when reading through it, it's, it's, it's sort of like Moeller taking like all these guys and, and compiling it into to one book. Yeah. That's what I found. Like, you know, he goes in, especially through the, throughout the periods. He starts in the early periods with, you know, Calvin, Bootser, uh, and then, you know, Junius, and then he goes into, you know, the, the you know, English theologians, you know, Ames, Perkins, all these, you know, you know and then high figures, Turretin, Maastricht, um, Owen, um, I don't know if I said it already, but I think that it's sort of a great introduction, not only a great introduction, but also like a, a really good handbook. And then, of mm -hmm. course, nothing should impede from actually reading the source 
which is but which Moeller is drawing upon. Um, you know, I think, you know, and, and, and it's not even to deviate from a lot of many modern people, modern people's favorite theologians, you know, a lot of people like Owen, but a lot, a lot of people like Owen for his moral theology, not knowing that Owen has, you know, very, very extensive yeah. doctrinal treatises upon which he draws in these principles when we're talking about, you know, incorporating mm -hmm. Thomas Aquinas, incorporating the Reformed Scholastics in this. Um, and so I think that's a great idea for people to start getting mm -hmm. into interwoven in all this, you know, don't, don't stay without the balance. Yeah. Start getting involved in the literature, you know. I think what a lot of people forget is that, you know, a lot of Owen's moral theology is derived from his dogmatic theology. So there is, I think, the tendency to avoid the more theoretical. Like, I, I, get, I get the impulse. It's a bad impulse. I mean... I think the impulse is bad. One because it's a bad understanding of what knowledge is. Knowledge, obviously, is the, you know, and what theology is. Theology, the genus of theology is wisdom, and that means theoretical and practical, right? So it's 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 anal analytic and synthetic, right? So the exegesis is tied with the dogmatic, um, and you can you can't really forget that. So I I I get the impulse to avoid the more the, you know theoretical stuff. It's like. If you're a pastor, it's just, I just preach the Bible. Why do I need to know about, um, you know, contingency? You know, why do I have to know about, you know, let's say, you know, the, uh, the uh, you know, hyper, what's, what is it? Physical pre-motion. Um, oh. right. Why do I need to know that as a pastor? I think you do need to know it as a pastor because, you know, there's something in law called, uh, you know, the, the inevitability of hard cases. It's, there should be something called in the pastorate the inevitability of hard questions that you need to answer as the pastor, right? Um, so yeah, it's just that's that's something that's it's it, yeah these these books are indispensable tools and aids for for you know pastoral training. So of course, yeah, and that's 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 a really good point. Uh, yeah, I mean the, the the last point I wanted to cover is just a very more so a practical one. Um, mm -hmm. It's sort of viewing the consequences of all of which we have been speaking of. Um, the, the the former two, or the former first and second centuries after the high Orthodox period, in terms of how it sort of deviated from its you know roots in in, mm -hmm. in its appropriation of of reformed codifications, how it sort of deviated from that piety that sort of, you know, the love for that tradition that in which it stems from. I think the practical, the, the practical consequences, it's not only seen in theology in terms of like neo-Calvinism, in terms of how, you know, how, how various doctrines have been appropriated, you know, distanced from how the Reformed Orthodox taught. But it, it, it also comes to show practical reasons in how, for example, you know, in ecclesiastical practices, in sort of, and this is what I mean by practical, in that a lot of times, you know, many associate Calvinistic people or Calvinistic believers, whatever, maybe may, many associate them with a lot of people who have a very low, low view of church, a very low view of the mm -hmm. sacraments, a very low view of um, a various amount of things, not, not only in theology, because I think that, you know, just taking, you know, the acronistic tool up and adhering to that. I think that's very lazy theology to begin with, but yeah. also just, you know, not, you know, the reformed Orthodox didn't just, you know, codify this great and vast amount of good theology, but, you know, they, these guys had a very high view of how the church is to function, how the sacraments are to be administered, you know, like, and Mo, like Mo, Moeller said in the, in the first, you know, in, in, the, in the first point or in the first paragraph of the article you mentioned, um, the one I the one I read is it's called um, how many points I think your yours said hello I'm um, not sure how what yours was called oh yeah that, 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 yeah, that was the one, one. Okay. yeah, yeah. He, he basically says um, yeah he, he basically says you know the, the 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 new sort of you know Baptistic um, American evangelical context where the church is only a strict association of adult believers. Um, the sacraments are nothing but a, a uh, it's not, not, not a sacrament, an ordinance. There you go. It's nothing but an ordinance mm -hmm. in that sense. 
And um, so how, how would you, I mean, what is your opinion on, on the, the great deviances, not only in a theological sense, but also in a practical sense? Because, of, of course, ecclesiology is one of the more practical things in the Christian life, right? You partake in the sacraments, you partake in the church life. How would you say that has greatly deviated or diminished in, in, you know, in comparison to the reform? Yeah, I think I think uh, what that what that goes back to is what I said what I said previously. It's like it shows you that that the system of reformed orthodoxy was important for the whole life of the Christian, right? And that's that's what Prolegomena teaches us. That's what the reformed you know analytic and synthetic me, uh, uh, method teaches us, right? It moved from Prolegomena to to Holy Scripture to God, and then to the last things, right? Just the basic movement of the Christian life, um, the last things, and the beatific vision, um, and you also see, you know, what is the definition of what theology is, right? The the character of a reformed theological system is, right? It's theoretical and practical. There's theoretical doctrines and there's practical doctrines, right? Things that we derive. That's a distinction that Muller argues that's derived from William of Ockham. Um, but it shows you that when you lose the system, you, you lose the piety, right? The piety is built on the system. And, and that's a, a, according to our, you know, we as moderns, who we, we are very anti-intellectual. Um, and we, we just don't, we want, we want piety without system. We want piety without knowledge. But there is no piety without knowledge, right? You can't do something that you don't know. Unless you're, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe it's, I guess, the, the influence of non, uh, not necessarily nominalism, voluntarily, I don't, I don't, voluntarism, I don't think that's why it happens. I just think it's because of the enlightenment. We just don't, we don't like knowledge anymore. We don't like anything theoretical, but it's like the theoretical grounds and informs the practical, right? You know, Paul talks about zeal without knowledge, right? You can have, yes, there, you can have zeal without knowledge. That's a bad thing. You know, your knowledge has to be informed by some theory, by some system. And obviously, what we're, we're not arguing that every person in the pew should, you know, be able to, you know, uh, you know, expound on Turretin, you know, just without notes, right? And that's not, that's not, that's, you know, that's beyond their jurisdiction. And that's not something that they're not, they're not called to, to do that. But they, they should have a thorough understanding of the Protestant system. And the Protestant system shouldn't just be reduced to the five points because exactly. yes, those five points are important. And as you said, they're reincorporated into reformed theology. Um, but there's, there's much more. There's the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the last things, the doctrine of the sacraments, which are, you know, the means of grace, right? How you view the means of grace will dictate how you engage with them, right? If you just think, if you if you're a memorialist, the way that you partake in the Lord's Supper is going to be very very different than if you have let's say, you know there, there there's I guess in this in this place Calvin is kind of normative, you know Calvin's doctrine of the Lord's Supper right that's something that we can say that's you know that's reincorporated into into the reform system right so if you don't have a proper sure. reform understanding of the sacraments, right it's going to it's going to affect your practical piety life. Because that, those are the means by which God has, you know, is, is communicating to you grace, sealing to you, saving grace. Um, exactly. So, yeah, it, it, it's really, really important. And, and I think we should, if, if we have that anti-intellectual impulse to only be concerned with piety and forsake theory, right? We just want to be pietistic and we want to, you know, we want to be spirit-filled and, you know, we don't want to be dry. It's like, well... We're going to have to do a lot of dry reading in order that we can have, you know, people who have active faith, right? Because, like, for example, look at look at the errors that were made by some Vantilians of the doctrine of God, right? I mean, God, we can say, is the foundation of all piety. But if you have a if you have a misconception of who God is, you don't have real piety. You know, pagans don't have piety. Muslims don't have piety, right? You can only right. write. There's there's a section in. Um, Muller's first volume on, on the, the relationship between theology and religion, their true and false theology, right? It's like they're, they're integrated and they're tied together. You, if you don't have true theology, you can't have true religion. Um, so it's, it's very, very important, especially for practical. I think 
the hardest part about reformed orthodox retrieval is convincing people that it needs to be done it's like oh we have the 20th century you know oh we have 20th century commentaries we don't we don't need we don't need we don't need it in a latin we don't need no we don't need to do that it's like i think we, we have do. bobbing already we don't need anything we have bobbing right. Ross and ventil we got the tree yeah. of the, of the reform theology. and it's like you know, some of those guys are good <laughs> Right, some of those guys are good, but like even to understand those guys, you got to understand the guys who predate them, right? Like, what do you do with the bombings volume one on a section on uh, epistemological realism when he's quoting Zanke and Vutius? Oh, uh, yep. if you're someone just enamorated with 20th century theology, you don't know what to do with that, right? Uh, exactly. so yeah, it's 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 extremely practical, and I think the biggest. Um, the biggest hill that you know people who are doing retrieval are going to have to climb is convincing the laity that this is necessary, and that's why I appreciate the Davenant Institute. Shameless plug. Um, I think the Davenant they do they do great stuff. I mean, especially attending their conviviums. Um, I spoke at one last year. Their convivium on long wisdom, and it's like you know just your everyday people, you know, here to talk about. And hear, hear me here to t hear me talk about natural law right it's your everyday right. people right and that's that's something that i found really really encouraging and i'm really excited for this year's convivium because it's convincing if we can convince the laity and if we can convince some of our reform professors that 17th century theology matters and 17th century right. theology as defined by the reform confessions and explicated by the reformed orthodox who who wrote those confessions right so it's like for me it makes no sense to uh to read to read an 18th century presbyterian on church polity when uh, an 18th century uh presbyterian on you know the westminster confession when i can go to the westminster divines themselves it just makes no sense to me it's like I think that the Westminster divines probably would have had a better opinion than someone in the in, than than in the you know twentieth nineteenth and twentieth century, right? So like right. no, right? The golden age for reform theology is not, and and I, and I have to say it about the reform guys in the twentieth century. I would much rather much rather open up the synopsis than go to Bovink, and it's not because Bovink's bad. It's because right. Bavink is built on the synopsis. And if I want to know the theology that Bavink is explicating, I, I need to know the synopsis. So, yeah, these, these, discussions, these discussions for me are close to home. I mean, especially since if you believe, not, not, you're not necessarily ostracized. I think Twitter is definitely a, a, a better place for people who are interested in scholasticism. And I, I'm very, very encouraged by Reform Twitter. It's like a lot of guys are starting to take the sources more seriously which is great they're starting to put away their ventilism and you know reincorporate aristotelianism which is great. a lot of, lot of ventil I mean, I've, I've debated so many ventils ventilians so you know yeah. if, if y'all are watching don't get offended um it is not anything personal whatsoever um it's just a simple analysis of of what mm -hmm. is the what is the true reform tradition essentially but, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, you it's you made a great Redu reducing this. I think it's more so of a Protestant thing. Um, oh, yeah, to, definitely. To it is definitely a Protestant thing. And, it's right. not a Catholic yeah, thing. Then, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because then you have these people that are so that are so disconnected, that are so empty of this intellectual knowledge and and rich yeah. intellectual tradition. They're so yeah. empty of that, and they're so. You know they're they're so you know not informed of this then that it, it makes for example I've seen so many converts to Eastern Orthodoxy uh -huh. or you know when, whenever I see people pondering between becoming a Roman Catholic and an Eastern Orthodox I say you have no idea what you're even talking yeah. about because if you yeah. if you're pondering between two very very different schools of thoughts two very different schools of theology and you're just yeah. pondering them like just like put a coin. You know, mm -hmm. clearly there's something intellectually that you're clearly lacking in. And that, of course, is stemmed from this Protestant, you know, notion that, or modern notion that, well, I don't need 
to 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 be deep into the to, to into tradition because all I need is the Bible and the Bible teaches the five points of Calvinism and then if, if that, that's sufficient for me then you know what else do you need you know so I think that does greatly need to be changed because it does affect the not only the practical lives and ecclesiastical life but it also affects you know the the the, the general convictions of, of of Protestant believers of course you know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so I, I was saying that this is a, it's a topic that, that's really close to me because, um, yeah, you can, you can oftentimes be ostracized from, from the general populace for caring for the quality of, you know, as I said, I want to be a lawyer, but I am invested in, you know, reform seminaries. You know, I'm very, very invested. You know, I, I, I really care and pray for for the prosperity of reformed theological education because i want i want good reform ministers i just don't want people who know a lot of things i want people who know a lot of things about god so that that influences their 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 practical life that right. you know when a, when a congregant has a really really hard question concerning the existence of god because of their co -work, because their co-workers are atheists i want I want the pastor to just sit down and thoroughly assure that believer of God's existence. And the only way that you can do that is through sound argument, through sound argumentation. Um, and that's, that's, that's why I care about it, right? It's like, as you mentioned, the converts, it's like, how many converts, how many people have converted, not, not even to, um, I guess, atheism is a religion, but just, you know, how many people apostatized? From Christianity because their pastor couldn't answer a simple question. Right. Exactly. That's so that's, that's bad, right? That's bad. And we that, that right. shouldn't be the case in the reformed tradition because we have the answers. We have the answers. It's yeah. just do we have enough do we do we have enough passion? Do we have do we want to you know sacrifice our lives to to that right. to that mission? It's like you know part of my mission. And like yeah we we have the answers for so many things, like not only just against atheism. Atheism is one of the most principal ones, but of course, you know, a lot of people today in the Reformed tradition, I've seen it many times, they, they, they battle not only between Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy, but they also battle between, um, you know, other different traditions within the Protestant, you know, realm. You know, you have Lutheranism, you have more you know, a, a lesser Augustinian tradition on soteriology, of course, which would then lead to like a sort of Arminianism. Um, you know, if, you know, if, if, if people can just go back to, you know, our, our primary, primary source and our greatest polemicist, Francis Turton, for example, he, he goes over, you know, over and over on all these topics on all the different low sides of theology. And, and, you know, for people to be disconnected from such a rich tradition, like you said, if uh, if, uh, if a congregant comes and says, "Oh, I have a I have a Lutheran you know coworker," he he says that you know baptism saves and that you know Christ is yeah. literally present in the in the supper, and he he showed me some scripture and I'm, I'm convicted. You know what are you going to tell me? And the pastor goes, "Well, the Bible also says you know," and then it's good to go to scripture, but yeah. you know what about the, the, the giants that came before you and every you know Vermigli who already smashed the Lutherans on this, you know, and then yeah. you got Turretin who you know box him in the head twice and you know no disrespect to my lutheran friends just yeah you know having some fun but th these are things that are already established you know mm -hmm. so. no yeah i think you make a good point i think yeah i think it's it's very very important and i'm generally optimistic about both the nature of reform theological education for the future i think the 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 massive progression that we've made in technology kind of allows for that because like you know yes uh and that's that's what's encouraging to see it's like a lot of people since they're kind of discontent with the current education that they're receiving it's like they're they're doing a lot of self-study and like you know self-study is not the best thing but um it's 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 kind of necessary at a time like this to do a lot of self-study and I think the thing that's really good about Moeller and Van Esselt is that that self-study can be 
you know, self-study is not necessarily bad, but that, you know, self-study without guides can be bad because you can just have a lot of knowledge about a lot of things, but you don't really know how to categorize that knowledge. And I, mm -hmm. I, I'm glad for the work of Moeller and Van Assel that you, you can have, you can, you can read the primary source material. And with these guides, you can start to, you can start to move around, I guess, you know, the forest and the, and the breadth and the width and, and just the vastness of the reform tradition. It's just, it's, 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 it's vast. It's like, it's really, really, it's crazy how vast it is. It's like, we have so much stuff on PRDL. Like there's so many things. But uh, it's only five points, man. Just five points. It's only, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, this is a really good topic. You know, I've been wanting to do this with you because, you know, you, you were one of, you know, one of the few, guys that I was still in touch with that, you know, kind of went along that journey with me, of course, from becoming more mm -hmm. to, you know, to then to the where we are now. And I think it is, um, you know, you, you never, you never stop seeing these, you know, these, these people going in the same journey. Um, you know, as much as we want to, you know, put emphasis on what exactly should be done if you're reformed, um, you know, there is cre credit is given, what credit is due, of course, you know, I wouldn't mm -hmm. be here if it wasn't God's providence. And, um, of course, you know, John MacArthur did sort of introduce me to all this. So, you know, like, like I said, credit what credit is due. Um, but then of course, looking back from where I am now, there's of course many, many things to be corrected, but, um, but yeah, yeah. if you have any final thoughts, you know, we can just. Uh, concluded i hope many people are edified by this especially if they're looking into the topic especially if they've been mm -hmm. going back and forth on this you know big twitter debate on whether you know scholasticism good scholasticism bad you know um if you have any final thoughts any final regards any final comments um no in, in i think that's all yeah i appreciate you bringing me on <clears throat> yeah this was really fun and i hope yeah as you said i hope it's edifying i hope it's informative and I hope I inspire some young reform people to pick up Muller. Of course. Awesome. Well, again, Josh, thanks for, for coming on. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll have you on soon for a theological disputation, you know, soon for, for some other thing, but um, <laughs> yeah. So thanks for, thanks for coming on. Uh, thanks for coming on. Anyone who's watching yeah. this far, again, thank you. For sticking around and um, stick around for the video coming out, um, I think I'm gonna publish that one before because that one I'm already I'm already good to go on that one. I'm probably gonna publish this during the week. But um, anyone uh, watching, thanks for watching, Josh again. Thanks for coming on. Thank you.